Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you here this early hour at our 815 service. Thank you for being here. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for just blessing us, letting us be here this morning, allowing us to open your word and to study it. Lord, be with us during this next 45 minutes, our first service this morning. And Lord, we're just so grateful for all the blessings you have given us throughout the week and opportunities to serve you and to tell others about you. Be with us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first song is Victory in Jesus. Number 82, Victory in Jesus. I heard an old dog story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory all oh, victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the songs of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. There are some songs that just take it out of you. I'm ready for a nap. <laughs> that was one of them. 
Our unison reading today comes from the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 16, 17 through 19. Please stand if you're able and comfortable. And for your convenience, this passage is in the bulletin this morning. I'm going to invite Brother Cody Frick to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. That he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her, and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And may the Lord add his blessings the reading of his word, and you may be seated. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about the mighty character, Bible character, Samson. Before we conclude his story this morning, let me give you a short review. Before Samson was born, his mother made a Nazarite vow on Samson's behalf. Samson would need to steer clear of unclean things. He would need to keep away from strong drink. And he would never be able to cut his hair. In return for keeping this vow, God would give Samson powerful physical strength. Samson grows up to be a judge of Israel. Israel during this time is under the control of the heathen dreaded Philistines. Samson takes on the Philistines many times single-handedly. While his fellow citizens of Judah cower in the shadows. If they would have just backed him up, they could have maybe beat the Philistines and been done with their being dominated by them. If the Philistines, but the reverse is also true, if the Philistines could rid themselves of Samson, then they could completely conquer, dominate, and enslave the people of Judah. There would be no stopping them. Samson is the only thing that stands in their way of domination. In the course of time, Samson falls in love with a woman named Delilah. The lords of the Philistines hear of their illicit love affair. The lords of the Philistines offer Delilah 1,100 pieces of silver from each of them. And some scholars say there were five lords. I'm not sure of that number, but that's what I'm told. If she will only, they'll give you each five, I mean, 1,100 pieces of silver from each of them. If she will not only discover the source of Samson's supernatural power, but the remedy to it. Delilah agrees. For several nights in a row, Delilah uses her feminine ways to seduce the secret of Samson's strength out from him. He teases her back. He tells her several untrue things. First, he tells her, if you tie me up with green stalks or green bowstrings, I will be as weak as any other man. Well, that doesn't work. If you tie me up with new ropes never used, that'll make me weak. It doesn't work. If you weave my hair into a loom, that will make me as weak as the average man. But all these are just lies, as as Delilah finds out. But Delilah is unyielding. She wants that money. She lusts after it. 1,100 pieces of silver from each of the lords of the Philistines would make her a very rich woman. So one night, Delilah just lays it all out. The Bible tells the next part far better than I ever could. Delilah says, How canst thou say I love thee? When thine heart is not with me, thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Wow. In other words, Delilah becomes such a nag about this. Samson wants to die. (laughs) What a happy couple. Have you ever dated someone because you're just too lazy to commit suicide? Have you ever known? 
And how Samson, and now Samson has, just has to give in. He, I'm ready to die. Please stop it. Please stop it. You're nagging me too much. Uh, the Bible says, then he told her all his heart. He told her everything that it was. And he said unto her, there hath not come a razor upon mine head. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me. And I shall be weak, become weak and be like any other man. In other words, Samson gives up, he gives in. All right, all right, I will tell you that maybe you'll shut up already. Listen, Delilah, my darling, my hair has never been cut. Not cutting my hair is part of the vow my mother made before I was even born. If my hair is cut, I will be weak like any other man. Delilah can't believe her ears. That's it? That's all it takes? A haircut? Really? Huh, go figure. And so Delilah goes back to the lords of the Philistines one last time and says, come back one more time tonight, hide in the spare room. You can nab Samson as soon as I am done with him. And don't forget to bring the bags of silver you promised me. Samson has finally, finally told me the truth. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. Perhaps someone is stringing you along, stringing you along about something. And then when you finally hear the truth, you just know it's the truth. You just know it's the truth. The truth just somehow feels different than a lie. Such as Delilah. She knows this time Samson has emptied his heart to her of the, of the truth. No more lies, no more deception. So that night, Delilah sues Samson, so he falls asleep with his head upon her lap. And you would think Samson would see this coming. I mean, come on, if, if, if this woman would tie him up twice and weave his hair into a loom and just say, oh, I'm just playing a joke on you. You would think Samson would suspect Delilah is going to give him a haircut in the near future. But he is either witless to this, he's captivated by her charms, or he just doesn't care, or he really just doesn't believe in the Nazarite vow. And we've seen some evidence of this. He goes along with it, but he doesn't take it too seriously. After she assures Samson is sound asleep, Delilah calls for the barber to come in and shave off Samson's hair while, he keeps, while she keeps his head still in, sleeping in her, in, in her lap. Soon after, Samson is balder than an eagle. Delilah one final time cries, Samson, the Philistines are coming. Samson jumps up just like he did before, but this time God has left him. God does not give him any strength. Samson is as weak as as any other man. Now before we move on, make sure I have time for this, I'm going to let you in on a debate that's been warring on for centuries about this. Why did Samson, why did he actually lose his God-given might after his hair was cut? Did Samson's long lock, locks actually give or contain some sort of supernatural strength? Or was Samson's faith in his hair the source, the source of all his might? Or was Samson's strength with him all along, but God just got so tired of Samson foolishly playing fast and loose with his Nazarite vow. So God just said, you know what, Samson, I'm done with you. Uh, you, you, you did take the vow seriously. You're getting your hair cut. I'm just going to take the strength from you. And the hair actually had nothing to do with it. Now, this has been debated for centuries, why he exactly lost his strength. We won't solve this question this morning, I assure you. I just wanted to give you something to chew on during lunch. Okay, anyhow, no matter the particulars, Samson is now minus his locks and he is also minus his super strength. He is now as weak as any other man. And I kind of picture him as even weaker because he's never had to rely on his own strength. He's only relied on his supernatural God-given strength. So he's probably like a little, a little child. He's never actually had to use his own strength before. I might be wrong on that. The Philistines' lords, of course, take full advantage of Samson's sudden vulnerability. They grab him. Even Delilah, the Bible says, uh, that, what did it say? That she um, uh, began to afflict him. In other words, she's smacking him around. The Philistine lords grab him and they do terrible things to him. Among them, they poke out his eyes. Ugh. They restrain him with chains and they drag him away. They then put him to work blindly turning a great stone grinding wheel. That's his job now. 
Now with Samson out of the way, the, the Philistines can now overpower and suppress the people of Judah, the Israelites, without fear or interruption. This becomes Samson's life now. Day after day, Samson turns a heavy stone grinding wheel day in, day out. But as the weeks progress in time, his hair starts to grow back and somehow his Philistine captors either do not notice or they do not understand how this whole hair thing works. I mean, I don't understand how the whole hair thing works either. Or they just forget the source of his strength was his hair. But as, his, as weeks go on, his hair grows, starts to grow back. And Samson plays it cool. He knows what's happening. He does not reveal that as his hair is returning, he is also feeling his strength returning little by little. One day the Philistine lords who did this to him decide to throw a great feast to celebrate their victory over Samson. And they're throwing this feast also to show their, their domination over their enemy, the Israelites. And during this great feast, they drink too much wine and they eat too much food. And then they brag, our God Dagon has given us great victory over our enemy Samson. Of course, their god, Dagon, had nothing to do with it. There is no god, Dagon, at all. It was only the one and only true god, Jehovah, who brought Samson to the Philistines, and we'll soon find out their victory is only temporary. As part of the entertainment for this banquet, the kings call for Samson to be unchained from his grinding wheel and brought to them so they can make fun of him and his god thinking they still have the upper hand, thinking they are so powerful over him, they begin teasing him. After all, what can Samson do? He is blind and, is, and he is weak, or so they think. Acting weak, Samson whispers to the boy who is leading him to the feast. He says, let me touch the columns that hold up the temple so I can lean against them and support my poor, tired, weak body. Now this temple is crowded with over 3,000 influential uh, Philistine men and women. They're all, they're all having a great time making fun of Samson and making fun of Samson's God. But all the while, Samson has been quietly, humbly praying, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. He's saying, Lord, just... One last time. Just one last time. Bless me with my strength, Lord, so that I can avenge you and I can avenge my blind eyes. And then Samson puts his hands on the column. You've seen this picture probably a hundred times. He puts his hands on the column, one column on each of his sides. He pushes with all his might. The pillars give way and the great stones of the building come crashing down in a thundering roar and a cloud of dust. It all comes tumbling down. The whole temple killing all the Philistine bad guys who are celebrating Samson's defeat and making fun of Samson's God. In the end, Samson has the victory over them all. But it doesn't seem or feel like much of a victory, does it? In order to have this final victory, Samson has to sacrifice his own life. I mean, he too dies in the building around him as it comes crashing down. So what can we learn from Samson's story? Well, Samson made more mistakes than most of our other Bible characters, that's to be sure. Yet, God still uses Samson and he allows Samson's mistakes to be used in God's favor and for God's will. Samson was given a great gift to be used of God. Many times Samson misuses this gift God gave him. Oh, we might not have super strength here today, but God also gives us gifts. Some of us, he gives special gifts too, not me. I'm, hoping, I'm assuming that's you. Let's not misuse our God-given gifts like Samson had. And thus concludes Cody Frick, the story of Samson.
There's just two verses of sweet hour of prayer. Number 439. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, thy wings shall my petition bear. To him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless. And since he bids me seek his face, believe his word and trust his grace, I'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. Amen. Please stand if you're able and comfortable. Our responsive reading today comes from Matthew chapter 22. If you recall, this is the passage where a young lawyer is trying to trap Jesus in his words and he asks Jesus a question. And this is Jesus' response. I'm going to invite Brian Evans to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. You may be seated. God has many attributes. God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere. God can be a God of wrath. God is a God of wisdom. God is a God of protection, justice, peace, and righteousness. And just like we say in our dinnertime prayers, God is great and God is good. Among his many other attributes, God is also a God of love. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's been my experience that no other attribute of God is as much under attack than his love. I dare say of all the other characteristics God possesses, no one characteristic is more doubted by mankind than God's love. I've heard it. I'm sure you've heard it too. How could a God of love allow children to die? How could a God of love allow wars and famine and injustice? If he truly is a God of love, he wouldn't allow evil to exist in our world. Dear brothers and sisters, when the Lord's definition of love doesn't match up with ours, keep in mind, he created love and he created love's definition. But that being said, when people falsely conclude that, that God is not a God of love, they usually then refuse to believe he exists at all. If there is no God, then there is, if there is, there is no God, if there is no God's love. They, the perceived lack of love may be the only attribute of God to completely negate the belief of God altogether. You know, it's funny, people still tend to believe in God when they falsely believe that he isn't a God of wrath. People still believe in him when they wrongly believe that he isn't all that powerful. People still believe in God if they falsely believe he isn't perfect. They, 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 if they incorrectly sing that God is just watching us from a distance like Bette Midler sings, this falsehood does not negate the existence of God in their minds. So why is it when naysayers discredit God's love, 
they usually discredit God altogether. Why? Why well, I believe it's because God is love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us exactly that. God is love. If there is no love, then there is no God. It's perfectly logical, and I agree with the logic, even though I don't hold to the same conclusion. Just as there would be no such thing as ice cream if there were no milk. Just as if there would be no, if there was no such thing as money, there'd be no banks. Just as if there's no trees, there'd be no forests. If there is no love of God, there is no God. Love is God's makeup. Love is God's DNA. Love is God's essence. Love is God's building blocks. And if you take away the building blocks, then you take away the building. If God is not a God of love, or if God does not have the capacity to love, then there just simply is no God. Fortunately, I believe in the love of God, so I easily believe he exists. What's my secret? What's no secret? What's make, what makes me and many of you different from the non-believers out there? Why do we believe in God? How do we easily recognize the love in him when others won't or they can't? It is because of this. It is because we've decided to love him back. What most people miss is that love with God is a two-way street. The way we recognize God's love is to ne and to never doubt it is to love him ourselves. The Bible tells us this. 1 John 4.19 says we love him because he first loved us. We will never fully recognize God's love if we do not love him back. It's just like in any, of other, uh, any, in any other earthly relationship, whether it be with our spouses, our children, our friends, or even our pets. Love is best. Love is more apparent. Love is more recognizable when love flows both ways. In my time, I've heard a few teenagers claim, my parents don't love me. With that statement, Quentin Harley uh, couldn't be further from the truth. His or her parents could not be more devoted or more loving to that child. But yet the teenager believes every word of what they claim, that their parents don't love them. Why does this teenager believe his parents don't love him? Because the teenager isn't loving his parents in return. I believe that is why Jesus Christ calls, gives us what is called the great commandment, the greatest commandment. You know the story, one day a lawyer among the Pharisees is trying to trap Jesus into exposing himself as a fraud. So he asks Jesus, hey Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus immediately replies, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Jesus reminds this educated lawyer and his learned Pharisee buddies what they should have already known all so well. He quotes the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, 5, that says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Now the English translators of the Hebrew Old Testament uses, use the word might. The translators of the Greek New Testament use the word mind. But it's all the same idea. We are commanded to love the Lord, our God, with our entire being. Why is this first commandment the greatest commandment ahead of all the others? Because obeying this commandment lets us recognize God's love of us by returning his love to him. We must love him to more easily see his love for us. Going on with the same story, even though the lawyer doesn't ask Jesus, Jesus then tells him what the second greatest commandment is. Jesus relays, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament Leviticus 19, 18 to be specific. Jesus then tells the lawyer, the Pharisees, and everyone around the story of the Good Samaritan. You already know that story. We'll talk about that some other time. But why are these two commandments so important? What makes loving God and then loving our neighbors more vital to follow than any other of God's laws? Well, the reason is simple. If we know and practice and obey these two little commands, love God and then love others, the average Christian really doesn't need to worry about much else. That's about it. If we grasp these two commandments, we can keep ourselves out of trouble and in God's graces. Because if we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind, or might, we will not take his name in vain. We will not worship any other gods before him. We will remember to go to his church every Sunday morning. We will not be negligent in praying to him. 
Obeying this one commandment automatically puts us in good order and obeying dozens of others, in short, we're good to go. After which, we, if we love others as ourselves, we will not steal from our neighbor, we will not kill our neighbor, we will not covet what our neighbor has, we'll, we will be kind, helpful, and forgiving. Again, obeying this subsequent commandment puts us in good order and obeying dozens of others. Again, we're good to go. This is what Jesus meant when he said in our responsive reading, on these two commandments, just these two commandments, hang all the other laws and all the other words of the prophets. Every commandment is hung on the concept of loving God and loving others. Isn't that a great thought? Isn't that a nice thing to know about Christianity? You know, very often critics will claim that Christianity is void of love. And if they're, if they're right, then we're doing it wrong. But I say to those critics that they are wrong. The very basis of Christianity, of what we hold to, of what we believe, is based on love. Now don't get me wrong, it's good to know more of the Bible than just these two commandments. In fact, it's good to learn all we can learn. But if we grasp nothing else, if we know nothing else, if we only know and obey these two commandments and we keep ourselves, then we keep ourselves out of trouble here on earth and we find favor with God in heaven. How wonderful this world would be if everyone from the highest king, the highest ranking politician, down to the lowliest citizen, the, the, the fella in the ditch, would just hold to these two commandments and keep them in their priorities. Well, let's get back to the sermon. Among his many other attributes, God is a God of love. Earlier I said, quoted John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I also stated earlier that with God, uh, love is a two-way street. Well, if our not recognizing God's love keeps us from recognizing him, I fear the reverse is also true. If we do not recognize God's love, he will not recognize us either. You say, that's kind of harsh, preacher. Well, the Bible does tell me that the Lord will say to such individuals, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know, I wish I had a ready answer to give you as to why babies die and why there's so much suffering and injustice in this world. But I do know this, despite that, God is love and he loves you and he loves me. Evil does not negate his love. His, he, he loves us so much that he wants none of us to perish. He wants all of us to have everlasting life. My advice to you, my advice to me, if we ever begin to doubt the love of God, just love him back all the more. And I guarantee our doubting will stop, our faith will be renewed, and we will start believing again. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your love. The greatest attribute that you could have is your love. The greatest commandment we have to follow is to love you. May we not forget that love. Sometimes it, we're, we're just mere stupid human beings and we, sometimes we forget about your love or we, we, we redefine what your love is, Lord. And, and, and Lord, just keep us from doing that. But let us always be mindful, no matter of, of the evil and the injustice and the suffering in this world, that you still love us. You still love us, and although we may not always explain that love, we certainly cannot define it. We know this is a fact, and we will never be negligent in believing in that fact. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to page number 56. God will take care of you, number 56. Please stand if you're able. Number 56. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Amen. I hope the Lord has a great day.
ahead of you this afternoon. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, may you see us safely to our homes or to wherever we're going. May we just leave with your love in our hearts today, Lord. And may we be willing to spread it to others. May we love not just you, but our neighbors, others, Lord, in our lives. And Lord, may you bless us for it. See us safely again to our whatever you have planned for us this week. Give us opportunities to serve you. And again, we'll give you the honor and glory for doing so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.